I'm nearly 31 now and I've been kind of like, you know, rehearsing, uh, rehearsing, you know, spiritually, mentally, psychologically, physically for this moment, you know, yeah. for the better, you know, part of my life, so. So, uh, no, it's just uh, one more step towards insanity, I guess. Sonic insanity, yeah. you know. So, um, it's always been good. It's always been good, besides Linda's bleeding. Yeah. It's so funny, actually, on the internet, there's like a lot of rumors that he's like a, you know, full-blown cocaine meth yeah, addict yeah, yeah, or whatever, yeah. but uh, we're just laughing our asses off because of that. But, no, everything's good. It's just, uh, it's been very, very different for the band, at least for me, because it's the first tour, a long tour I've been doing sober, so mm -hmm. that's a big difference, but, um, but, uh, and it also, you know, has mellowed the rest of the guys out a lot as well, so we're not partying that much, rather mm -hmm. concentrating on music, so I, I guess that that's our only chance, you know, there's always better parties, there's always people who can drink more, but there's not a single person on earth who can play love metal better than us. Yeah, yeah. So I guess that that's our forte, and we should uh, yeah. concentrate on that rather yeah. than uh, on the, uh, you know, the other activities. <laughs> I've done it, you know, I write all my music sober yeah. and I can't work on it, you know, if I'm, yeah. if I'm drunk or whatever. And uh, so uh, that wasn't a problem, it's just, uh, you know, you know, you easily tend to, um, you know, wipe, or wipe a lot of the rubbish underneath the carpet. Mm. And I did it by a bottle. And, uh, and uh, you know, it's not the prettiest sight when you... I've just let the carpet be. I'll, I'll let the uh, magic carpet ride, the black magic carpet ride happen when I go back home in Finland and start, you know, start writing new stuff on my guitar. But also, also, you know, when it's just... Uh, you know, when, they, when it gathers up, it takes a long time to clean it up as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little tiny bit of piece you have to separate and, you know, put into the right places, decide what you're going to throw in the bin and where you're going to stay, yeah. an archive. Yeah. So uh, that's how it is. But, uh, no, yeah, but it's like, you know, we do a lot of things with him, with the whole band, and we seem to do a lot of things backwards. So uh, that's one of the things. I kind of like, for the, the last 10 years have been my last 10 years, and these are my mid-, mid next 10 years, if you know what I'm saying, yeah. you know, it's just, uh, it's, you know, I've, you know, feeling good, rejuvenated, you know, feel like, you know, starting back from late 90s, something, yeah. like all of this was just a very vivid, you know, dreamlike sequence, yeah. you know, dream within a dream, as Edgar Allan Poe yeah. once wrote down. No, what's my plan, no, basically, my, uh, the, the, the only thing, you know, you easily get up in a situation where you're very self-centered. Obviously, when you're a writer or you're a so-called artist, you're very self-centered because you write the songs and you write the, about the, you know, the things you've been going through yeah. yourself. And uh, I kind of like, for some reason, forgot the existence of my parents who have always been really close to me because of my drunken haze. And, um, and uh, I don't want to disappoint them. I don't want to disappoint the band. I don't want to disappoint our lovely manager, Sepp. I don't want to disappoint you. I don't want to disappoint... Yeah, you know, myself, I just, you know, if I'd be a slave to a, you know, a bottle, that'd be kind of, that would be uh, not necessarily the most, you know, exciting way to go. Everybody can do that. I'd rather be, you know, electrocuted on stage, you know, I guess that that'd be like cooler. Like that. I'm, I'm writing bits of bits all the yeah. time, but usually, you know, when we keep on uh, traveling, you know, we're, we're in a different hotel room, you know, every other day, so it's fairly hard to concentrate on finishing a song. But yeah. a lot of little, you know, I'm, yeah. you know, rambling on, you know, just writing things down and uh, a couple of mel melodies here and there. And usually when I get the time to relax back at home, that's when I start writing new stuff. But uh, I got ideas for maybe about, like, 12 songs or yeah. something. But also, Venus Doom must be in... You know, I don't know why. I don't know whether I'm, um, you know, just a masochist or something, but it seems that always writing new stuff, you know, you have to like dig deeper within yourself and within, you know, uh, you know, you know, have stronger uh, lenses to to look through, you know, under, you know, at the stuff underneath the carpet. So uh, I'm afraid to go there, you know, so it'll take me a while, you know, just to, you know, go back into the stuff because I'm really addicted to music. And uh, I just want to give myself a space, you know, which is I need time off to be really taken away by music again, and especially being sober because I used to, what I used to do was I get so into it, you know, 10 hours, 12 hours just passed, and I couldn't sleep after it because all the melodies, everything starts, you know, playing in my, playing in my head. And, 
and what I do is to go to a pub, talk about the weather, and down a few pints to calm myself down. So that's something uh, you know mm. I don't want to do now. So it's going to be a very intriguing thing because now, I'm, for the first time after nine and nine, I'm starting to work in my sleep as well. So that's really co yeah. cool. I wake up with ideas and I write them yeah. down, and they're not necessarily great ideas, but it's kind of fun. Mm. Yeah, so in that sense, I do feel like sixteen again. Uh, well, I'm thinking about it like an itch that never goes away. No, it's just something, you know, it's, or an itch you can't scratch, as they say. Uh, well, so obviously it has something to do with the relationship I was in. And, uh, you know, it's, um, relationship is very easy to end when it, when there's like a big negative reason to do it. But when you're kind of like on the verge, you're dancing on the razor's edge, and there's a lot of positive and a lot of negative things, and it's hard to balance all those things. That's what makes it complicated for me, at least. I mean, that particular song, it seems that uh, through all the negativity in the relationship we had, uh, we were sleepwalking past hope because we had a lot of hope and we had a lot of similarities and a lot of things we could have worked on, but us being stupid young people who are fairly young, uh, that uh, had too much their own shit underneath the carpet that should have been cleaned out before, you know, start with a clean plate, you know, clean slate, and, uh, you know, I don't know, it's a, you know, it's a very universal thing, that's, relationships are tough, that's what it's all about, and it's just, you know, it's, it's about when do you really want to let go, you know, when is the time, because nobody's, nobody can tell you the time to let go of a relationship, you know, or let go yourself. When's the right time to go with the flow? And when do you have to keep yourself in control? Nobody can tell that to you besides yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's the toughest lesson in life, I guess. It, well, that happens to a lot of people, and, and, but the tower falls in different directions, and different people have different cushions to fall, fall on, you know, after it, you know, it's, uh, and when it comes to love, you shouldn't be having plan Bs. You know, you just have, you know, you just, you know, it should be total submission to your passion, to your uh, senses, and to your heart, I guess, you know. Rational, you know, I don't believe in a thing called rational love, you know. But, uh, uh, you know, it's, so I in a way, it's like, you know, singing that song takes me back to the situation, and also it takes me, it makes me ponder about future, what kind of decisions I'm going to make. You know, because I'm a really indecisive bastard. Uh, uh, it's always different. It's always different. It's, you know, it's, um, I guess that uh, for me personally, be, you know, it's like Eskimos got like over 30 words for snow. But we only have one word for love, which is love. You know, of course, there's you know adoration, ad, you know, all all different kind of little tiny adjectives describing the thing. But they can't describe it. And love is very different with different people. So even though if you're writing about separation or falling in love, it's always different because you fall in love for different reasons, and it's always a uh, uh, it's and that makes it interesting when it is a new combination for yourself, and you always feel you know a kid very giddy, you know, when you, when, when, when it starts and overwhelms you, and that's, that's beautiful, that's why I write the songs, because I can't put that stuff down into mere words, especially me, my funny accent, and me come from Scandinavia, so, so it's easy for me to put some of the emotions down in melodies, and, uh, you know, get the, get the mood out that way. Very often it seems that a lot of people find themselves in a tough spot. And when it's a matter of, you know, love and death, it's uh, just, when you really have to make big decisions, at least for yourself, you feel that you're on the verge of losing it or gaining it. Or I think that that makes life worth living for, right? Makes it challenging and makes it, well, it's, that's the only thing that keeps me going, at least. So, you know, the, Who's that? Yeah, was, well, the office thing, you know, I, I heard about it for the first time. I'm not big on myths, but uh, 
for mythology in general, but uh, uh, one Finnish director um, asked me to write something for his film uh, about like three, four, four, maybe four years ago, and uh, the film's called Honey Babe, and they actually ended up using one of uh, him songs and the uh, end titles, and it's got a, like the Orpheus, the story of Orpheus is the main theme. A guy falling head over heels for a lady and, you know, the lady, for one reason or the other, you know, you know, going to the depths of hell and, and the guy being so desperate that he realizes he needs to do whatever he can, even lose himself in the process of saving her. And uh, that's what love is all about, just losing yourself and letting all go just for a uh, little hope for a smile. And... Uh, and then he uh, goes for it, and uh, and uh, because of his uh, extremely, you know, his extreme talent, musical talent, he uh, he uh, plays his song so well that the uh, masters of hell start weeping and and uh, and appreciate the song so much that uh, that they. Uh, they say that your office, you know, take the check and run, but never look back. Don't look back when when you're uh, climbing out of hell, and and that's the thing in the myth, you know, that's been speculated. Why Orpheus looks back? Is it just a curiosity that killed the cat? Is it, you know, what is it all about? Why he had to look back so he lost his life forever? Did he, did he actually do that for an artistic purpose? To be eternally suffering and to be able to play songs that make even the, make the whole earth, all the living creatures in it weep. Just uh, in search of, uh, you know, the kind of like creative depression everybody seems to be talking about when it comes to artistry. So it, it's it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell. But well, basically, that's what Orpheus did afterwards. You know, he kept on playing, and uh, you know, met a few other chicks, and he wasn't interested. But the chicks were so turned on by the music he played that they, uh, in a sexual frenzy, ripped him apart physically. And uh, you know, that's a good way to go. You know, maybe we should try to get a couple of groupies to do that to us. You know, that'd be kind of a weird sexy ending but um yeah the heads yeah well they I, I think that you know there's different variations of the story but they uh physically rip you know all the limbs out and it was you know it was just the torso and the and the arms separate and the head was you know floating about on the river and and it ended up in the isle of lesbos i guess where the you know term lesbian came from mm -hmm. so it's kind of you know weird old myths but uh you know, I guess more or less, you know, uh, it's a story of being an artist in a way that you have to, you have to, or you're born that way that you want to lose yourself entirely what you do and you're willing, for one single successful note, you're willing to give up everything for that particular moment in time, just to be able to uh, be reborn through a note or through a, through a line of words or uh, and the, and the search for that can be extremely haunting for a lot of people and I guess that that's one of the reasons that a lot of people end up being, you know, mentally ill or end up, you know, committing suicides or doing way too many drugs or alcohol or whatever just to numb the sensitivity that comes with being an artist. Because you, you have to keep your ears and your eyes open, all your senses open to all the possible stuff that goes around you, like a sponge sucking in all the possible information. And then when you're filled with that, it just bleeds out of you. And uh, hopefully it bleeds out in a way that you can be, it can be a cathartic process for, uh, for, the, uh, for the artist, and then it can be hopefully very cathartic for the, for the person who sees or hears the piece of art. And uh, it's not something you're trying to do, it's something, something you have to do to be able to exist, I guess. That's the reason why I do music. It's, that's how I started. I didn't know how to cope with the world. Uh, and uh, then I find an instrument. I found an instrument and, and through that I, f I, I realized that I'm able to cope with the world and its evils a bit better through writing songs. 
and, and uh, that keeps me safe. That's the comforting part. And uh, and it's worked for me since I've been, maybe, I wrote my first song after my big heartbreak when I was about 13 years old. So it's been nearly 20 years I've been writing that stuff. So, so um, yeah, I wouldn't exist without that little piece of wood there, mm. which is incredibly interesting in a way. Well, well, I guess to a certain extent, it's, it's also everybody is an artist in a way, and everybody's got their story. Everybody is a living, breathing, you know, piece of art. You know, everybody's got great stories. Everybody, yeah. you know, and uh, it is the way of the world to a certain extent. You know, you have to be. You know, if you decide to have kids or whatever, you have to make sacrifices. You know, you can't do. You know, you know life's about compromises at the end of the day. But as as little you can. You know, compromise the better. Yeah. That's Charles Baudelaire. That's Charles Bukowski. That's a Finnish writer called Dima Mokka. He, but his stuff has never been uh, translated. Yeah. But he's a, he's a guy who used to live in the middle of the woods in Lapland in Finland. And uh, he, uh, he lived only 29 years. He looked like 60 when he died. I don't know, there's stories about him being a you know, crazy alcoholic, just you know, down in bottles and bottles of vodka and just riding in a manic frenzy. But uh, but uh, he also had a family, and I heard that he was a great father, you know, um, and he was a visual artist as well, and he wrote about, you know, the life in little tiny towns and villages in Finland. They're very extremely sexual and very depressing, but he, you know, very, very few writers write down, uh, write down their thoughts as they really are. Yeah. You can tell when you read somebody, and you can actually tell that it's not, he, he hasn't been editing himself to be more uh, appreciated in literary circle, circles, yeah. in a way. Yeah. I'm not saying that it's dumbed down. I'm saying that, you know, you just, you can instantly see the flow, but that is a flow, and it, but you know, the brush strokes get heavier by the end of a sentence, or they don't, or lighter. Yeah. And that's how he wrote. And, um, um, and he's just one of my, one of my uh, idols in, in a way of of being you know being a father good father and uh, and uh, in support of the family and then still living a very passionate life and being able to get you know uh, get so much out of himself that you know makes life worth yeah. living for you know so, uh, I guess it's not one of the things that uh, that uh, his stuff is so uh, it's so very Finnish, and not even Finnish, it's more Lapish. So the language is really hard to translate, because there's a lot of words I don't get, because it's, it's old school, and it's like a lot of dialects that have, you know, very few people use. So it's very, very hard to get the whole vibe down. And I think that some of his, done, some of his work has been translated into, I guess, German or, or Swedish, but uh, I don't know how well it would do in English. It's like, you know, those like rural writers here in America, you know, when you're writing about a certain very yeah, specific yeah, yeah, yeah. place and you have to write it in a ver very certain specific way to get the actual mood of living in there. And nobody who's ever been there can get the entire right feel out of it. Well, I've, I spent a couple of weeks actually in Lapland to write Venus Dune. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I've, I uh, rented a cabin in the middle of the woods and uh, just went there and uh, ended up you know, hooking up with all the local reindeer herders and uh, listening to their stories and taking helicopter rides over the mountains and wrote a few songs. I actually start, uh, wrote the basic ideas for Sleepwalking Past Hope back in Lapland and for Cyanide Sun as well. And I can hear the Lapish influence in those two tracks from Venus Dune because for me they sound, uh, you know, what the right word for it would be, they sound really widescreen, like really cinematic and really, there's like a big landscape behind the music. It's a very wide angle. Uh, and, uh, and I'm really proud of those things. I can really hear the, you know, the, the sound of the north. Yeah. So I was thinking of maybe going back there for the next album. But it's, you know, people tend to be, keep very much to themselves. You know, they're not very open. Not a lot of chit chat going around. And, and they're very honest in a way that there's no small talk and they don't bullshit you. So let's say if I walk into a bar, somebody can, uh, a guy can walk up to me and say, are you a good guy? 
If I say, yeah, I consider myself a fairly good guy. Okay, in that case, just come along and sit, with, sit down with us. So it's that direct. Yeah. There's no bull whatsoever. Yeah. And I love the honesty in that because it kills, you know, you kill a lot of time by trying to please people, trying to, you know, have the mask yeah, on. Yeah. And back in the North, they don't care about that. And that's, that's, the, that's the cool thing about it. It's something very unique. But now, nowadays, also, you know, because of so many things being more liberal, it means that kids have to stretch further and further to make themselves noticed. You know, if you know what I'm saying, you know, culture and all that, you know, there's not so many taboos anymore. And obviously, kids are always searching for taboos. You know, if we just think of, let's say, intoxicants, you know, back in the day, you know, weed was a, like, cool little illegal thing. It's nothing nowadays. Meth is nothing nowadays. Cocaine is nothing nowadays. And smacks not interesting for anybody. You just not off, mm. you know. So it's they're searching for something. They're searching for you know what, what would they call it? like George Bataille, like transgressional mm. literature, mm. something that rips the uh, reality around you apart, and re and you can restructure it, you know, through the way you clothe yourself, through the way you live your life, and all that. But you know, the the search for. Uh, individuality is becoming more obsessive at all times people want to be so different you know people just uh, you know rise to the barricades and barricades and trying to hop over the boundaries to see if the grass is greener on the other side you know it's just a lot of people don't do that on a psychological or a, on an intellectual level you can still get a lot by just reading mm -hmm. you know a lot of thoughts and a lot of ideas a lot of people seem to, you know, I'm not saying everybody, but seems to have the obsession that you have to, you know, show your individuality and your your crazy identity through outer means, and that's not important, I guess. You know, the, you know, just rather, you know, shut up and say one really good sentence once every ten years, and you'll be a god. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to a lot of people, you know, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not saying that you should do that, but yeah, yeah, it's just yeah. um, it's very good ways of doing that. But you know, that is kind of crazy, and that's that's why I'm, you know, obviously, as, especially in America, if you're just watching telly, what's on there, it's getting ridiculous. All the reality shows and everything, nothing's taboo anymore. Yeah. So it's what are they looking for next? What what's going to be the next kick? Murder mm -hmm. or well, like suicide is going to be a kick or something. And he has in, uh, you know, in, in the near, near past. Well, that was a sad thing. He was uh, this introvert. It seems, I don't know that case very well, but introverted 18-year-old uh, guy with tendencies towards neo-Nazism. And uh, he was really in his own cocoon, you know, didn't know much about the outside world. And, uh, and uh, he just threw whatever information got the idea that he has the right, right to kill people. And he's doing that for the purification of not necessarily the race, but for mankind. I don't know on what kind of spiritual level he was working on, but uh, it's kind of weird. It's tough to get guns in Finland, and uh, we don't have any, you know, um, metal detec detectors in schools or anything like that because uh, Finland is considered to be a very, you know, safe country, and a lot of people do have guns. But most most of the people are, you know, northerners who um, who uh, use them for hunting, you know, yeah. and uh, or who whose hobby is just, you know, shooting at a track. So that was a uh, that was a tough thing. It's Oxford's, Oxford's something about death, um, the great book, by the way. Um, there was a story about, uh, that happened during one of the depressions or whatever in England, and, you know, 16, 17, something, and, uh, and, uh, you know, there was a family with three kids, and, and, uh, and, uh, they were struggling with money, and they heard their parents, parents fighting about it, so the three kids aged maybe 11, nine and four, they all hung themselves in, uh, uh, in, the, in the kids' room. And what they wrote down was a note to their parents that we did it so we wouldn't be so many for you to take care of. The, the ultimate power is to denounce all power. You know, that guy, for example, in Finland, he was apolitical, uh, you know, uh, like a everything asexual, apolitical, anti, a-anti everything. So he was just basically trying to make himself as a blank canvas, which is extremely hard to do if you're 
living in a loving family. So uh, that must be a horrendous journey he's been going through and all the pain that he's been going through to actually cross that border into insanity and, uh, and do all those horrible things he did. You know, it's... But also, the good thing about humanity in general is the fact that, uh, you know, terrible crises and terrible catastrophes, they do appear to have the um, impact on people that people become closer to each other. As they, they start valuing about life a bit more after that. And people who, neighbors who hated them, you know, hated each other previously, they can't even hold hands occasionally. So it seems that a lot of, a lot of people are so self-centered that it does take a catastrophe to all of a sudden for them to realize that there is life outside of themselves and, their, and outside of their families and, uh, and universal concerns and a thing called universal compassion and love and hope. I've been a vegetarian for a long time. I was a vegetarian when I was a teenager for about seven years, but then when touring, uh, it became extremely hard. A place like Portugal or in Belgium, it's hard to get proper vegetarian food. And uh, so I started eating fish again and chicken. Then I met a deal with my dear friend Lee Dorian from, uh, from a band called Cathedral. Became a good friend, you know, a couple of years back. He's he's really adamant vegetarian, and you know, I just gave him like a birthday present. I said, "Yeah, okay, I'm going to be a vegetarian from now on." This has been the last last year and a half. Uh, no, I'm nearly vegan, but I do, you know, I'm like a vegan who eats chocolate. So I'm trying to avoid uh, dairy products as well, and uh, and I eat. Well, I'm nearly fruitarian as well, so I try to skip all the rice and bread and everything, but uh, it's just I'm trying to find the right diet for myself uh, to stay healthy and tour. You know, it's very hard to, you know, when you're traveling a lot, it's very hard to live on pizza for, uh, for months and months on end, you know, it's just, it doesn't work. So, Linda, he does fish, but no, no chicken, no red meat. Gas is, uh, is an omnivore, he eats everything. So, he does a, does a few asanas every now and then, <laughs> but uh, but uh, it's just uh, it's basically it's a matter of uh, 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 also just to be able to sing because you know when you sing when you play gigs you have to breathe through the tummy and you know if you eat meat you know digestion is so very slow that uh, it's very you know you can't use all your capacity as a singer so it's good to eat just a lot of greens and that's why I do. It's not, it, you know, I'm still wearing leather stuff, and uh, I'm not just, I'm not, you know, not really uh, politically involved in that. You know, it's just, uh, let's say it makes things simpler, mm. and it makes me feel better, so that's why I do. I've never done any you know, illegal driving or whatever, so uh, I don't drive, I use taxis. I just hail a cab. But, and I'm not very environmental when it comes to that, I don't, you know. You can do basically anything if you start thinking about it. If you start thinking about all the stuff, you know, humanity is doing to the environment. It must be very hard for kids to learn what to, who to trust and who not. But, you know, with all the information on the, on the, in the internet, and then just, if you flick through different news channels, everybody's got a different take on the same story. It's like, who do you believe? And then all the urban legends floating about, all that stuff, you know. It wasn't like that back in the day. Mm. But what, what is the dark side? Well, because, you know, let's say that if we grew up, let's say if we go to school and we learn about our history, let's say most of the um, most amazing art, visual art, has been done by very religious people. And um, most of that art is really, really dark. If you did think about Dante, for example, or John Milton, or a lot of those people, you know, they, they had a really strong relationship with God and, and a very Christian God. And uh, still they actually, they poured out all the Gothic imagery that all the anti-God people use nowadays, more or less. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's just Im imagery, you know, anyway. You know, it's just uh, word association, word games, you know. The word God means so different things to different people that it's nice to play around with them. You know, as they say in the Bible, isn't it? Or do they say that in the Bible? But they, has, they, they were saying that uh, the greatest trick of Satan is uh, 
is that, uh, you know, he's wearing so many masks that people still do think that he doesn't, you know, exist. Maybe, you know, the God people are worshipping, you know, is the true evil. At least the Vatican is. You know, when a religion is based around money, then it's not, it doesn't have anything, you know, with spirit, anything to do with spirituality. That's why I say, you know, what did Jesus do? in the temple back in the day. And at the end of the day, one of the main sins is, you know, the main deadly sins is hatred and aggression. What did Jesus do? He became extremely agitated and extremely anxious, you know, of the Pharisees, and he, you know, nearly destroyed the church there. And then he was crucified for his sins, I guess, and ours. So it's a very complicated myth, the whole Bible, you know, the Old Testament and the New if you think of all those things. And um, I, don't, I don't have an extremely, you know, uh, great need to find myself a savior. You know, I don't need that. You know, my, my savior is all around all the time. You know, it's just the world around, the people around it, the stories they tell, and it's the whole thing. And that's what keeps me going. Be just dark and empty, and there would be anything left. It would be just a void. Then it'd be pretty miserable. But uh, and you know the the constant battle when when we're talking about you know we're talking about issues of morality. You know, it's very interesting. You know, as what you said about people pretending to be you know God's disciples doing very much the opposite that that's taught in. in New Testament, but also then, you know, there's a, a, you know, the vengeful, hateful God of Old Testament. He was a tough guy as well, or was, or is, I don't know. Uh, Kalevala was, the, that's the, like, the, that's the book. And we had, uh, we had actually, uh, there's a one old guy called Daina Moinen, who uh, played a lyre type of an instrument called Kandele. And he, he sang songs and everybody listened. But he was a, the old wise man. And there's a lot of stories. There's, the, there's like, you know, Hades. There's like Karen, the similar sort of like the, the river of death that you pass. And there's a lot of similarities. And, uh, and my knowledge on, on early Finnish culture is very limited. It's a tiny country, nomadic country. I'm not sure, you know, it's been mixed with Vikings because we're not the true Vikings in that sense. Then, so there's a lot of Russian influence, I guess. But, uh, you know, that's basically what, you know, that's what Christianity did, you know. They came on over and they built on all of the old holy places they built their churches upon, you know. You know. So, it is a rape of the culture, in a certain sense. And, you know, but imagine Pan, the yeah. great called Pan, that actually being Satan, yeah. you know. And, uh, and Santa Claus. Yolopukki in Finnish, which means Christmas goat. You know, that started from a tradition of actually like guys knocking the door like on Halloween with wearing goat masks and just going in and ravaging the place. Pillaging, raping, and looting kind of a thing. You know, just being the rock and rollers without the music. And uh, so there's a lot, of, a lot of weird cultural things, especially when it comes to Christian world. You know, they took so many elements out of, uh, but that's, but that, but that's, a, that's, a, the thing for me, I don't fight against it. I find it fascinating how human mind and how the people have worked. It's like a piece of big art. Let's take that bit out of that culture. Let's take that and just create our own little clusterfuck and uh, just claim it that that's the right way to go. You know, you really need a lot of confidence, a lot of guidance, whatever guidance that is, to be able to actually, you know, successfully, fairly successfully, you know, to do that if you look at the world nowadays. Well, you know, what's fascinating uh, touring with this particular band and with these particular songs is, is that it seems that in each and every city where we're playing gig, people do appreciate different songs and different moods and different vibes, you know, a bit more rock and roll energy type of a thing seems to, you know, dig deeper into the collective psyche of a particular group. It's, it's just weird. And that's kind of what makes it really interesting. You never know what's behind the, you know, what's around the corner. Yeah. So. So, and that's probably one of the reasons why we still keep on doing it. Because uh, if it would be exactly, you know, it would be just repetition, it'd be super boring for everybody included, especially the audience. So, uh, 
Every, everything's fairly good now. Everything's fairly good. It's uh, the band's tight, but it's it's such a hard thing to get five people who spent most of the year living very close to each other, you know, nearly sharing bunks in a bus, and everybody knows each other, you know, throughout, inside out, and and uh, it's tough to get five people to work as one, work in unison, you know, when when playing a gig, and then getting all the technical aspects right then hopefully getting a lot of people good attendance at the gig and the sound right and everything like that it's always a bit of a gamble but that's you know that's that's kind of that's one of the things that also makes it exciting you know, because there's always weird stuff that can happen and and uh and usually when the beautiful you know the perfect imperfection happens you know that's when you that's when everything is right it's great it's it's yeah. funny you know I'm, i've known linda since i've been like 12, 13, and he's a very, you know, he's a, he's a very quiet, introverted character, but he's been opening up a lot, and you can actually hear all the emotions and the frustrations through his playing, you know, and, and he's changed as a, as a musician a lot, you know, he used to be more introverted as a, as a guitar player as well, and now he's kind of like, he liberated himself, I don't know why or how, or, you know, what happened, but it's great to see uh, that kind of a flower and bloom. Same with the rest of the guys, you know. Gas is still struggling a bit, but he'll get there. It takes that funny extra step you can't take yourself. It just happens naturally on a good gig, or, or it's just transformation that happens slowly, that you just uh, immerse yourself, you know, totally lose yourself in the music so much that uh, you do things that you never thought of, and you can't remember what you just did two seconds ago. That's a great thing. Yeah. So, you know, if I would be... Um, you know, singing for Aerosmith, I'd be saying that that's very, you could compare that to making love, you know, the best thing is when you just lose yourself. You're like, what? What just happened? And, um, and when that happens, it's very, it's very, it's a great high. And that's probably one of the reasons that a lot of musos and writers, you know, try to, you know, run after that high with, uh, what, with some uh, intoxicants or whatever. But with also, you know, I, I do have a bit of stage fright, not not too bad nowadays, but uh, I used to have a bit bit of that. And when when I started singing, that was the time when I still was a drummer and a bass player. So I, I was used to carrying something around with me. So that my crutches on stage were, you know, having a cigarette and having a bottle of red wine and a beer or something like that, because I felt naked without. So now still the cigarettes. We'll see when I when I cut down smoke and leave that and what will happen then. But. Uh, but uh, no, it's just a, it's a collective push musically towards something. I don't know where it is, and it's, it's just nice to be nice to be where we are musically at this particular moment. You know, it's just you never know what to expect. There's also a tradition of people like, let's say, Jim Morrison. He didn't do a lot on stage. Everybody just remembers him doing the shamanistic dances yeah. or whatever. He did them like twice. Yeah. He was just clinging onto the mic and trying to get the story through. Yeah. So there's a different tradition in that sense, but Nick Cave, he's a great performer though, yeah. but uh, but uh, I guess that when I was a bit younger you thought that you have to do something, you have to learn the ropes or do the moves or do something, you know, to be able to be considered uh, as a great performer or whatever. I guess that the most challenging thing is to lose yourself so completely in, in the music that you you still rather tell the story through the music than than doing something pre-learned, doing like a Justin Timberlake routine. That's a different cup of tea. It's a different way of entertaining. Yeah. But uh, if if we could, if we would be able to at least get a you know a tiny little percent of the people sucked into the mood of the music and really like overwhelm them with the music, that's the best thing, I guess. Especially nowadays, because there's always somebody who looks prettier or cooler, who's got a leaner body, who can do a cool you know, backflips or whatever like that on stage. We're not, we're not a Jim Rose Circus, you know. They do their stuff extremely well, but what we're trying to do is to, you know, uh, musically create that, you know, the sonic aura of something hopefully different that hasn't been done before. And at times it, you know, and I just, I like it when, when stuff starts happening un uncontrollably and from, uh, and because of an unconscious source, 
or subconscious source, you know, it's, uh, I guess that, that's what you call, that's how it started, the term being a natural. Things happen naturally. Just flow out of you and you can see the difference compared to artists or performers who rehearse their craft. And you can do both, obviously, but uh, I'm, I'm tend to steer away from, from theatrics. You know, city, theatrics, you know. Yeah. If, it, if it does happen, you know, does ha I don't know. It's yeah. something I don't, I don't think about too much of it because I guess that, you know, singing itself is fairly demanding in this band and, and getting everything right. And when I'm on stage, I don't think about myself. I think of the band and the sound of the band. That's also one of the reasons why I sing a lot of the times with my eyes closed. So I don't have any distractions of, let's say, pretty ladies or people waving at me or whatever. It's beautiful and it's nice to, but at times you, it gets, takes you away from the mood of the song and the sentiment that's there to be brought forth. So, so uh, I'm listening to everybody on the stage all the time, you know. So I'm like listening to an album I'm not a part of. I'm listening, you know, I'm just a puppet. I don't know, and the puppeteer is the whole collective, you know, consciousness of, of the band him, you know. So it's not, it's not that self-centered anymore. It was more when I was um, wasted on stage. It's funny that uh, a lot of people who've never been to our gigs and maybe you know, just seen a clip of a video or believe the, the rumors that were really satanic and driving the kids nuts, you know, they're the ones losing the whole thing that, you know, at least when I'm looking at the audience from the stage, you know, a lot of them people are smiling. They're singing along and, and it's a cathartic experience for hopefully everybody. You're going through universal pain together, you know. Yeah. The pain of losing people around you and the pain of growing up and the pain of, as you grow up, learning that you actually don't know anything. And, you know, just, you know, the world becomes day by day a bit more complicated place. And it's basically good to, good to know that you're not alone. And it was extremely interesting for me. I actually met somebody yesterday that uh, she'd been talking to a couple of fans. She was a fan who did an interview. and uh, and. Uh, some people said that, you know, listening to the music of him makes me not feel alone, makes me help me through, you know, sleepless nights, you know, like thoughts of suicide, you know, yeah. what Nietzsche once said. But, uh, but uh, the funny thing about that is that uh, that's exactly what music does to me. That's why I write it. I'm not alone when I write music. And it makes me help, you know, it makes me get through many a sleepless nights and and uh, and and to and to be able to confront the negative the negativity in the world in general with a smile on my face more or less it's tough and it's hard and it's hard for everybody but uh it's crazy how you know a person lives a zillion miles away in a place called Helsinki sits on his bed um feels something and picks up a guitar and puts that feeling, you know, into the music, couple of words, couple of chords, and through a long process, gets that thing recorded, and all of a sudden, the music spreads all around, and what, it, what happens is that it does exactly the same what it did for the, the perpetrator, so to speak. It's, it's, it's a weird cycle that it does, it seems to do, for a lot of people, and, uh, but, but also, you know, m music is, you know, everybody's got their sonic diary and everybody listens to different bands for different reasons and everybody does listen to certain songs because they, you could, they recreate the smell, the sense, the, the, the whole atmosphere of the situation of the past. You know, when I listen to Madonna's Live to Tell, I remember my, you know, first disco, you know, the slow dances with a lady I was, you know, into when I was like 12. Or whatever and uh, those are great memories so that's also one reason why I, why I write music but also that's the negative thing for me because I can't feel that you know I just feel the moment the, 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 the sentiment where I am at at the moment where I'm writing it down and at times it's 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 painful and at times it's it's rejuvenating hopefully both at the same time